Hello. Excuse me. I am looking for a ham, a hickory honey ham. If there are any left, they'll be back there. Thank you very much. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Excuse me. today. Some of you love Christmas a lot in this room. You love all things Christmas. You love the romance of it all. You love the lights. You love the tree. You love the scent of pine in your house. There's some of you who love every romantic Christmas show on the Lifetime channel. <laughs> there are those of you who listen to Christmas music at random times of the year just because it brings you joy. Anyone? Oh my, yes. Wow. You guys are sick. <laughs> Whereas there's others of us, let's, we'll just say, we're tired going into the Christmas season and we're exhausted coming out. Dateline NBC and Prevention Magazine just took a poll recently. They said the three most stressful things in our world are, number one, going to the dentist. That's me. I'm a good Scotsman. Number two, getting a speeding ticket, which isn't my case. I've never had one. <laughs> in a car. <laughs> or the entire Christmas season. Rounding in third. This survey tells me that, that there's a lot of people that do not have joy during this time of the year, as Jack was just preaching a few minutes ago about and taking all the time. I thought you were going to preach. You were doing a great job. It's been a couple of weeks. Could, anyway. Not sure what we're going to get. There you go. <laughs> so let's show him what he's going to get. <laughs> This survey tells me that a lot of people, there's a lot of stress at this time of the year. Too many expectations, too many things on the calendar, too many toys to build, too few parking spaces at Costco, not enough credit cards to max out, too many bills, too many parties, too much weight gain, too many Christmas lights to hang, too many presents to wrap, too many pressures, including how am I going to make the perfect Christmas dinner? And there's too many in-laws telling us what we're doing wrong all the time. Not to mention, it's too difficult coming up with a perfect family picture during this time of the season. My family just, well, we just have two new kids in our little Christmas extended family photo. Uh, it used to be just us four, but my father-in-law got remarried, and now there's two little ones on that side, so all the little kids had to be in it, and it was a complete nightmare. It was so bad that we have to go on December 24th back to the Christmas place and have them take another photo, and hopefully it'll be done in time for Christmas Day. Huffington Post just presented the best of the worst photos of the stress of the joyful season of Christmas. Here's a few of the beauties. Let's take a look, Gary. What do we got? There you go. <laughs> there is joy. <laughs> Great joy. Let's go to the next one. I have, I have a few. Here we go. That's awesome. Let's go. Here, the little guy in the middle looks completely unattached to anything joyful. All right, next. There you go. Oh, yeah, that's just great joy. Next. <laughs> All right. That little kid, man. <laughs> Put him in therapy. All right, here we go. Have a holly jolly Christmas, everybody. It's the best time of return to Santa. <laughs> Okay, I'm going to plug my ears. It's just that bad. All right. Have yourself a merry little Christmas. Looks like the parents threw those letters on the kids. The little girl got beamed in the head. Look closely at the little guy in the middle. All right, let's continue. <laughs> and this is our last one. Bringing joy 
this Christmas. Thank you, Huntington Post, for those. <sighs> Joy is slipping away quickly. When people ask you, actually, somebody asked me this week. They said, hey, we should get together for dinner. Wouldn't it be great? We should get our family. We should get, and Todd was Jenny that said, hey, we should get together. And I said to her, you know what? Can we just get through the Christmas season first? And she looked at me and she said, well, that doesn't sound like joy. Joy is fading fast. It reminds me of Job chapter 9, verse 25. This verse that says, my days are swifter than a runner. It's just like this season. My days are swifter than a runner. They fly away without great joy. The danger is that oftentimes we turn to medicate ourselves. Maybe it's in this season, it's through alcohol or through prescription drugs or maybe even in the arms of someone who isn't our spouse. Maybe it's through retail therapy. I don't know what it is, but man, this is a tough time of year. And as I was putting this message together, I came across this painting, and I thought this was interesting. Maybe you've seen this before. I had to brighten it up so you could see it, because it's actually a very, very dark painting. It's by Rembrandt back in 1646, and there's a lot of things that are interesting. It's of the Nativity. It's called The Adoration of the Shepherds. And there's a number of things that are really interesting if you, if you pay close attention to it. But one of the things, and just to touch base on it really quickly, is the fact that if you look at that painting, there's no light shining on the baby. The only light is coming from the baby. And it just kind of struck me that really, that's exactly what Rembrandt wanted to get across to us. That the joy of this season isn't being close to him. It's having him in you. It's having God's love coming out and having that personal relationship with him. If you're close, you might get a little bit. But if you want true joy, you got to have him in your heart. And it all flows from there. It all comes from there. So this morning... I wanted to talk about specifically how to find and maintain joy this season. What do you have to do in order to keep that and not lose it? For some of us, the reality is we don't even have it. And it's not that we're a Grinch. It's just this is stressful. And so how can we find joy? How can we maintain joy this Christmas season? So let's pray and then we'll dive into this. All right. Will you bow your head with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning, and uh, <laughs> God, we kind of make light of some of the things and the craziness of what's going on. Jack made reference to it. Jelaine spoke very eloquently on it last week in the mess of Christmas. But God, again, we just, there's some of us that just need you to touch us where we are. We could use some joy. Things are difficult. Life is messy. So God, I pray that in the midst of this message, that you would touch everybody in this room. Uh, that it wouldn't be some guy just speaking, but that you would literally, you would speak to them in their heart. Uh, whether it's in a verse, or a thought, or an idea, or maybe something that jogs a memory, or something. Something that they can take and hold on to and capture and motivate them to move forward uh, this Christmas season. So, God, I just pray that you would take the words of my lips and meditations of my heart and that they be pleasing and honorable to you. We pray this in your name. Amen. All right. Luke chapter 2 has been kind of our springboard of uh, this verse that we've been touching base on. And uh, it came from when the angel appeared to the shepherds and he said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all people. And we've talked about, the first thing the angel said was, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of great joy for all people. So today we're talking about this idea of great joy. And so the question again is simply, how do I find and maintain joy this Christmas? How do I make this Christmas count? Because let me just say this, I think that if you want to make this Christmas count, we have to be deliberately intentional on the things that we do. We must be deliberately intentional. I think we need to create pathways for us and our families so that when we actually get to Christmas, when we get through Christmas Eve, we won't go, oh, I'm so glad it's over. 
but that we can actually walk away and say, you know what, that was a great season, and I'm still filled with joy. You know, it was a little weird at first, but I'm feeling it now. I feel like God is all in. We don't want you to be spent. We don't want you to be exhausted. We want you to be thrilled about the peace and happiness. So how do I make this Christmas count? How do I maximize this Christmas? Here's four thoughts to consider. And by, by no means are these exhaustive. These are just a few thoughts that I put together. So four things to consider. Number one is to ask yourself, what do you want this Christmas? What is it you want? And by that, I don't mean what toy do you want? What new Lexus or what new this or that or what new watch? It's what do you want to take away from Christmas? What is, what is the bigger picture? Because oftentimes we go through Christmas season not talking about specifically what we want to get out of it. We don't voice it. We don't really speak about it. We don't talk with our family with regards to it. We don't talk about what we want in terms of our time or our budget or what we're going to do to, to help people. We don't really voice this. Because when there is no clarity, there is no unity. When you're just kind of doing things and you kind of have some ideas and you don't let other people know your expectations, things become ambiguous. Things get fuzzy and you don't really know and you're not all on the same page. It's hard to have joy when there's no unity, when we haven't clarified what we want. So let's be honest and let's ask ourselves, how do we keep Christ at the center? How do we keep Christ at the center of our finances, with our budget? How do we keep Christ at the center of with our friends, with our calendar? with our children? What do we need to do? What do you need to do in order to have that? When I was uh, in sports and playing in many different teams, one of the best coaches I ever had was a guy that would talk to our team prior to the game. And oftentimes before the game, and I don't mean just before, but leading up to the game, and he would say, okay, here are my expectations of you. And for each person on the team, he would go through and say, this is your job to do in this game. I expect you to cover this guy and to watch that, and you should be there for every single play. Be a gnat, annoy that guy, be all over him. That's your job, Murray, you got it? You got it. You know, whatever you got to do, just do your job. Okay, I'll do it. He'd say, when it comes time in the dressing room, here's what we're going to do. Here's the music we're going to play. Here's my expectations of that. And then when you get out there, you do that. And you make sure you're looking out for him. And if he drops that, you show up. And it was very clear what our job was to do on that day. There was no question. The expectations were set. You know what? If you could do that going into Christmas and you sat down with your spouse and you said, you know what, here's what we should do. Let's actually make a plan. Let's prepare for this. Let's be intentionally deliberate on what we're going to do with our calendar so it doesn't drown us. It doesn't kill us. Here's what we're going to do with our finances so we're not huge in debt at the end of the season. You know what, one of the great things we did, just personally, I wasn't even going to say this, but a couple of years ago, I think it was Jelaine that was speaking. might have been Jack. It was definitely a Hawkins. They, <laughs> they, gave, us, they, they gave a message. They talked about uh, gold, frankincense, and myrrh being given to baby Jesus. And you know what? Our family has adopted that. For the last few years, we've given our children three gifts. And the Christmas tree is no longer piled up. With, it never really was. But it's, it's three simple things that mean something. I was talking to a guy about it just the other day. And he thought it was just the greatest idea ever. It freed him up. We need to maximize all of these things. Be deliberately intentional. Come up with a reasonable plan. Proverbs 14 says the naive the naive believes everything but the prudent man considers his steps he comes up with a plan thinks through what's going to be done and there's this other verse in a book called Haggai it's kind of a weird name book I asked Jelaine how you pronounce it here in the states she said haggis <laughs> <laughs> this is what the Lord says give careful thought to your ways Listen, as you move into this season, you got to be deliberately intentional on what you're going to do, what steps you're going to take, when things, don't just let things happen. Think through them. Come up with a plan. Second marker in order to maintain joy this season, in order to make Christmas count, is to ask, who can I find that is in need? Who can I find 
that is in need. When we, look at, when we look at the Christmas narrative, when we look at the actual story, it's all about Jesus coming to us. It's about Jesus seeing a need and doing something and responding to that. Doing whatever it would take. You ever wondered what that was like for Jesus to come to earth? To be at one moment in the luxury of heaven with God Almighty and in the next to be on a cow's feeding trough. To one minute be around angels in the power of the universe and the next be here with a bunch of shepherds and, and mud. I mean, what was that like? You ever wondered what was going through his mind? Because I've, I don't know, maybe it's just me. I've wondered that many times. And I found this little verse it has nothing to do with the story of the nativity in Matthew or Luke but it's in Hebrews and it tells us very specifically what was going through Jesus mind when he came to earth Hebrews chapter 10 verse 5 Jesus is speaking to God the Father here's what he says he says therefore when Christ came into the world he said sacrifice and offering you did not desire but a body that you, a body you prepared for me with burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were no longer pleased. Then I said, here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. In other words, Jesus is saying to his heavenly father, God, the father in heaven, you know what? You're no longer happy with the old system with the whole sacrifice and stuff like that. You want one way to do it, and you want me to be that way so that I will pay the price. So we no longer have to continue to do this routine monotony. And I will pay the price, and I will do that for all man because you've asked me to. If you're not sure exactly what that is, it's a phrase, radical generosity. That's what that is. It's radical generosity. The Christmas narrative is all about radical generosity, God seeing a need and God acting. And so the question simply for us is how is, generous, how is generosity playing a part in your Christmas story this year? Because it plays completely in the face of what our culture dictates. Our culture is not about radical generosity, it's about unbridled consumerism. Christmas isn't about giving, it's about taking, it's about consumerism, it's about buying, it's about getting and receiving and whatever I can get my hands on. That's what it's about in our culture, isn't it? And we walk away on Christmas night with hands full and our hearts are empty. And the Christmas story is that God gave his very best. Do we see that? Can we get that? Can we act on that as well? Can we just do some of that as well? <laughs> Identify people in our life who are needy or maybe longing or hurting? You know, we're trying to teach our kids how to have radical generosity. And over the past year or so, we've, we've tried to do little things. So uh, we'd find books in the room the kids no longer read, and we packed them up, and we said, we're going to go and give those to some people that we know because they have little kids now. Are you cool with that? Yeah. We'd go find toys that they have that aren't broken up, clean them up, good, reasonable toys, clean them up, and go give them to other people that are in need because it's just being generous. We're trying to teach our kids that. Well, it happened again this week. I was looking for an illustration, and I, I had one that I planned, but this happened, I thought I'd share it. So, uh, my son just did that sleepover thing on the Star of India, that field trip, all right? And uh, I didn't have to go, praise the Lord. So, uh, so, I didn't go, but I went to pick him up at 10.30 or whatever the next day. He hadn't eaten the whole trip. He didn't like the soup they ate. What is it, the rats do? Good grief. Anyway, never, so he didn't eat the rats too. And in the morning they had like porridge or something. I don't know what they had. He didn't like that either. He ate one graham cracker. So my 10-year-old son, who after hockey practice can pile through a full large pizza himself, ate one graham cracker over about 12 hours. So I picked him up and that kid was starving. So I said, all right, we're going to Denny's. Let's do this. And so we went to Denny's, and with my debit card, that kid went for it, right? And so he's packing it down and having a great time telling me stories. And we even took a selfie. I think we have a picture of it, right? There it is. So here's there's my boy. Now, 
the picture's of me and him, but the picture isn't really of me and him. And I wish I could have got a better picture, but my phone is awful. There's a couple in the back, and that's who the picture's of. So as I'm sitting there listening to my son, and he's just, piling, just throwing the food down, just piling it down, I keep watching this older couple, and they are an elderly couple, and they are the cutest thing you've ever seen. And they are clearly in love, and <laughs> they're just sweet, they're holding hands, and it just seems like they've gone through a lot of life together. And I keep kind of watching them and hanging with him, and so finally I just said to him, I said, Caleb, look at that couple over there. And yeah, I said, should we just, should we buy them their, their breakfast, not tell them? Should we be generous? Yeah, let's do it. So should we, and we'll, we'll even tell you know, the waiter, don't even let him tip. Should we do it? Yeah, let's do it. So we grabbed the waiter, and he came over. I said, listen, we want to buy them their breakfast. I thought it was, maybe it was dinner for them. I don't know, it was about 10.30. <laughs> but, so, hey, we're all going to be there. Come on. And so, so we, told the waiter, we told him what we wanted to do, he was a little weirded out, they had to go get the manager, I told him, it's all good, so, so they went and, they, and we took the bill. So I told Caleb, I said, son, now listen, when they tell them, don't look over, like, let's be super stealth about this, so I'm kind of looking over, watching, sure enough, the waiter walks up to them and begins to tell them, and they look over, my son is in full stealth mode, you know, <laughs> you know? I'm like, don't knock it off, you know. <laughs> I'm like, this is being generous, and this is being, I use the phrase, a secret Santa. And he said, Dad, this is about giving. This has nothing to do with Santa. And I'm like, oh, he gets it. You should be speaking, not me. <laughs> and so we just watched as this couple looked around the room. And, I mean, they were so sweet, and they were so confused, <laughs> and they were so happy. And uh, so we tried to take that little selfie. And then, you know, they left. And so that was our moment. I went to pay the bill. I asked for the senior discount, but I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> what would it look like for you and your family to be radically generous, to look for need? You know, we were being generous to someone who may not have really been in need, but how would it be for you? Maybe instead of giving away old stuff, we could donate some of our best stuff. You know, some of you in this room, you have stuff in your closet that still has a tag on it. Wouldn't it be great if you actually donated that? Well, that would be unreasonable. I don't think I'm not going to do that. Proverbs chapter 11 says, Give freely and become more wealthy. Be stingy and lose everything. The generous will prosper. Those who refresh others will themselves be refreshed. It's not just about money and handouts and stuff. Radical generosity is also about time, and it's about grace and peace and sharing what we believe. How are we generous with that? How are you generous with what you tell about who you are? What if we were personally intentional with inviting people to church about that Christmas invite card that Jack was talking about? How could we do that? You know, Jack talked about walking around and putting it in a mailbox. What if you were, what if you were generous to the point of you said, you know what, I'm not just going to kind of maybe do it. I'm going to take someone out for coffee. I'm going to be so intentional. One of my friends, I'm going to meet him for coffee, and you know what, I'm going to just put it in their hand. That's what being relational is. It's just getting after it. By the way, can I just show you something? This always depresses me a little bit. Maybe because I'm the one who makes these cards. Every year, we have a lot of cards left over. This year, with about 10 days to go, I have almost half left. So you shouldn't make that many cards. <laughs> We have enough cards for every, almost every regular attender in our church to have two. One for you, one for someone else. And I got half left. Wouldn't it be great if we could actually take these cards and invite someone to be generous 
radically generous with your story. Maybe don't even tell them all about the whole Jesus thing. Tell them about what you believe. Tell them just how God has worked in your life. To be generous to the point where someone goes, man, I'm so glad you told me. I've just been looking for something. You'll be surprised how often that happens. Share the story. Look for needs. Look for people around you. Third thing, to maintain joy in this season, is to, <laughs> and to make Christmas count, to maximize Christmas, is to give the gift of presence. And by presence, I don't just mean showing up. I mean giving your attention. Jesus showed us the wonder of the incarnation in John 1. It tells us that the Word became flesh, the Word became human, and He lived among us. Jesus came and lived among us. He wasn't on His cell phone. He lived and paid attention to what was going on. How can you give your family your attention this Christmas? How can you give people around you your attention this Christmas? Maybe it's consider turning off your electronics for one hour every day with your family. Maybe it's coming up with things to do together as a family that are just totally different than you ever have before. Here's, here's a thought. I don't know. Take it for what it's worth. Go home. Go get some Christmas wrapping paper. Flip it upside down. And tape it all over your living room table. Wherever you sit down as a family. If you sit down to eat as a family. That's a novel idea too. But imagine you sat down together. And then go through the Christmas story. And ask each person, what does that story mean to you? Write down a word. Take some markers and just start writing things. Or draw a picture on there. And leave it for the next week. See all the stuff, that, all the conversation that happens with some markers and pens and stuff right there on, those, on that table. I don't know. Make a memory. But be intentional. Give them your attention. Make moments, make memories, and create new traditions. Give them the, the gift of your presence. I don't know what spontaneous thing you can do, but you got to come up with something. Pay attention to them. Okay, i got to tell this story because I'm a proud father. All right? Here's another hockey story. I apologize. So my son was selected to go and and be part of a shootout at the Honda Center uh, during the Anaheim Ducks hockey game, NHL. And so he got to do it during the intermission, which was pretty cool. And uh, which, and by the way, in this country, you don't have one sport that everybody loves. You have many sports that lots of people like and love. But if you're from the rest of the world, and that's part of the luxuries of living in the States. I mean, you can do so many things, and there's so much wealth, and you can just, you know. But in other countries, for the most part, it's soccer, right? The world loves soccer. But in Canada, it's freezing. You can't play soccer. Summer's only two months. So you play hockey. It's nine months, and that's all you do, and you grow up with that. And if you understood a little bit about Canada, that's all they care about. They don't care about anything. Literally, they're insane up there. And so, as my son has learned to play this game, um, I mean, uh, growing up there, it's just a huge deal. So when he was selected to go and do this shootout, man, I was all in. He was excited, but man, I was just like off the charts excited about this. This was the, this was the highlight of my life. And so, uh, it was great on so many levels. We go to the Honda Center. I got a few pictures of it. Bear with me. So here we go. We're going to the Honda Center. He's got his gear. We hike all the way in. All right, next one, Gary. Here he is doing a shootout. They got the camera on him. He's in front of 30,000 people or whoever's left who's not buying their beer during the intermission. All right, then they interviewed him uh, on TV which was very cool. I was pretty stoked about that one. And, uh, and I mean, I was so excited. I'll just leave it there for a sec. So, because that's cool. <laughs> Beaming proud father, right? So, I don't know why I'm emotional. That's weird. I do have tear ducts. <laughs> Jack was wrong. <laughs> weird. It never happens to me. Josh. Okay, tone it down. So, uh, one of the things that's weird, I, when I moved to this country years ago, I mean, I knew that things would be different, but I don't have any of my side of the family living here. So, they don't, uh, Caleb's never had an uncle that's gone to a hockey game. We don't have family that comes to, to watch him. It bums me out a little bit. 
and uh, Josh and CJ were playing the band when CJ left. It really bummed me out too because they would come and they were so obnoxious at games and so loud and <laughs> everybody loved them. The team would ask for them to come all the time. It was hilarious. I'm like, who are those guys? I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> but like, they're from my church. Just, you know. So one of the highlights was that uh, Jack and, and Jelaine showed up to watch Caleb do this deal. And uh, <laughs> not only do they show up, Jack shows up with this. <laughs> I think I got a picture of it, right? There you go. <laughs> There's big head Caleb. So when Caleb's doing a shootout, Jack goes running down. He's there on the glass shaking this, trying to get Caleb's attention. How cool is that? <laughs> you know, my son hasn't had an uncle show up, but he had his pastor show up. Jeez, what's wrong with me? Dude, get over this. I must be tired. <sighs> this is weird, man. I'm sorry. So his pastor shows up, and I mean, that's the gift of presence. What are you going to do for someone? Pay attention to them. And lastly, just very briefly, to, to maintain joy, find something to read. And by finding something to read, I mean, read the story, Matthew or Luke. Luke chapter 2, Matthew 1.18. You know the story, but read it with your family. Read it by yourself. Look at the nuances of the text. Pay close attention to it. See what really happened. The Advent is something that was started back in the 4th century. And they started the Advent because they wanted to, rem to think through what was going to happen when Jesus returns. But then someone in the 6th century said, no, 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 no. It's not just about when Jesus returns. It's about what Jesus did. And we need to celebrate that. It's all about the Advent, the adventure that Jesus showed up and did something. And that's why we do these things. We have communion and that leading up to it. It's all about preparation for him coming to us. So read the story. Find a word that, that plays out in it. Ask your kids, what does it mean to have hope? Ask yourself, what does hope really mean in your life today? My goal is that you will find something that will make this Christmas count. As Romans 15 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of his spirit. And my hope is that when January shows up, that on December 26th, Boxing Day, everywhere else, that you would be able to look back and say, man, this was an awesome Christmas season. And I'm so glad that my Heavenly Father is the center of it. All right, let's pray. God, we thank you.